Welcome to the Business of Story podcast, where the world's best storytellers from business, Hollywood, and beyond teach you how to use stories to communicate and connect with your customers. The Business of Story is sponsored by ACT, the best-selling customer management software for small business, Oracle Marketing Cloud, enabling businesses to target, engage, convert, analyze, and use marketing technology to deliver a better customer experience. Sixter, helping clients maximize the impact of every single email sent and by Zignal Labs, the real-time cross-media story tracking platform. Here's your host, Park Howell from Park & Co. and today's special Business of Story guest. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Business of Story. I'm Park Howell, and today we have another really interesting guest that helps us explore that intersection of Hollywood storytelling artists with commerce, content marketing, and business. And uh, why I really like today's guest is because I think I would love to have been in Hollywood. Maybe it started way back when. Maybe if I had the guts. Uh, I did actually travel down there with a friend of mine from Seattle. And being a bumpkin out of Seattle when I got there right after I graduated from Wazoo, I was completely overwhelmed with the city, uh, with Hollywood. And it just blew my mind and I had to get out of there. So I ended up close by in Phoenix, Arizona, running an ad agency. But um, Hollywood has always fascinated me for a number of different reasons. I love movies, of course, but I'm really fascinated fascinated by why do they work? Um, screenwriting, and you know, we've had on this program Robert McKee, the foremost screenwriting coach legend. We've had Lisa Crone, who teaches authors and writers and screenwriters. And um, I, I have learned so much from these people, and they are always so open and generous with their time and their talents that uh, we've been able to use the, the tricks of the trade from Hollywood and screenwriting and producing in our work here at Parking Company as we work with clients really around around the world doing this. So today it's particularly interesting for me because we've got a young writer here who has his first movie under his belt. Um, it's produced, just waiting for distribution. But this gentleman has had an amazing experience in Hollywood. And he's here today to uh, share with us his road, how he found himself over here in Arizona while still working in LA, trying to get a movie uh, distributed. Now it's produced with some pretty big names in it. Um, teaching at Arizona State University, or will be teaching at Arizona State University here in spring, a uh, screenwriting course. And uh, he just has some tremendous insights of what's happening in Hollywood in movie production and distribution and how it is dramatically changing, how TV has dramatically changed, and how that impacts all of us in our content marketing and branding world. So without further ado, I would like to welcome to the show Justin Trevor Winters. Welcome, Justin. Thank you very much, Park. It's uh, very wonderful to be here. I'm very honored. Well, it's great having you here. I got to tell folks how we actually uh, met. I was literally over at a massage envy waiting for my massage about six months ago, and I picked up a local lifestyle magazine, Uptown Magazine, and you were gracing the cover of this magazine. And it says, I can't remember what the whole title was, but but Hollywood screenwriter moved to Arizona, and I was reading through the article while I was waiting for my masseuse, and I thought, man, I got to reach out to this guy. This is really cool that he's in town. I would love to talk to him about what does he know that Hollywood knows that we could all know? And I sent you, that was a Saturday, and I sent you a note, I think, literally from my iPhone before I went in, and you responded like six o'clock that evening, and then we got together the following Monday, and we've become fast friends ever since. Um, and so it's great to have you here, and I know what you're going to share with our audience today, and I'm so excited about it because you were right in the heart of, of entertainment distribution and the sea change that is taking place and how storytellers are still probably the most sought after commodity in Hollywood. And dare I say that storytellers are probably the most sought after commodity in marketing, branding and content marketing. Um, so welcome again and tell us a little bit about your background, Justin. Um, sure. Do we have a couple hours? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see where to start. I, uh, I went to film school. Uh, UC Santa Barbara, which is a wonderful, wonderful program up there. Uh, I studied uh, film primarily with an emphasis in production and screenwriting. Um, so got my foundation there. Uh, UC Santa Barbara is primarily known for being theory-based mm -hmm. and history-based. So uh, watched a lot of films, uh, watched a lot of television, 
um, you know, got a good history of, you know, the process of filmmaking and storytelling. Um, so I spent four years there and left and went down to Los Angeles. Um, you know, always knew that I wanted to be a screenwriter, uh, you know, had that creative uh, bone or bones in my body and uh, got down to Los Angeles and recognized that there were a lot of people just like me trying to achieve screenwriting and quickly also learned that it was not just the creative process that was important about screenwriting, but it was actually the business side of screenwriting. After all, it is show business. Um, emphasis on the business, especially these days. So uh, one of the first jobs that I had while in Los Angeles was working at a talent and literary agency, uh, Innovative Artists. Um, while I was there, I was assisting uh, the head of the lit department, uh, an agent who was representing some very big clients in town, anywhere from uh, Catherine Bigelow, who's known for Hurt Locker mm -hmm. and Zero Dark yep. Thirty, um, Peter Bogdanovich, who's obviously an amazing writer-director, has been around for a very long time. If you haven't seen Paper Moon, one of his classics, I highly recommend it. Um, Stuart Beatty, as well, was one of our clients who mm. wrote a little movie called Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> uh, he created the Captain Jack Sparrow character. Uh, phenomenally talented writer who we found actually out of the UCLA Extension Writers Program in Los Angeles. Uh, but yeah, while I was there, you know, as an assistant to the head of the lit department, my job was uh, reading scripts, uh, doing coverage, um, getting a better understanding of storytelling. Uh, so as a screenwriter, it was such a great foundation yeah. uh, to, to learn that process. You know, I went to uh, uh, Robert McKee's famous, famous story screenwriting course in L.A. a few years ago. And uh, I joined our son Parker there. He went for the Hollywood side of it. I went for the business side of it. There was 250 people sitting in that uh, crowd, and he said only one of them would actually get a script to see the light of day, and they would have to go through the lights of you, right? Yes. I mean, what, what did that look like? And what do you mean when you say screenwriting coverage? And what do you look for in good writing, good sure, storytelling? Sure. Um, I would say Robert was probably being optimistic and generous by saying even one person. Yeah. Um, you know, sadly, I think it's it's such a cutthroat industry and so challenging. I think the last numbers that came in were, if we're talking strictly features, uh, 60,000 scripts are registered with the WGA, which is the Writers Guild of America, every year. 600 of those get made um, or produced in some way, shape, or form. So that's 1%. But you have to look at what that breaks down exponentially as. So, you know, scripts are constantly being registered and not being made. Mm -hmm. um, so the percentage game of actually getting your project done is lower and lower every year. And the people who are getting projects done usually either have connections in the industry already mm -hmm. or are writers that have been writers for, you know, years. Um, so, but part of my job at Innovative Artists and, and getting back to your question about coverage was, Coverage uh, is a very important thing that happens um, in a literary agency. You know, we have at agencies, you have scripts that come in, not only from the clients that you represent, but also from um, networks or studios that are looking to staff up writers, which mm -hmm. means they want to get writers to write on those projects or, um, you know, material coming from other writers that want representation um, or there's just a lot of different areas that these scripts are coming from and they land on an agent's desk and they're expected to read them um, and decide whether or not it's a project they want to work on. Mm -hmm. So coverage is, um, is as it sounds, you're covering the project, you're covering the script. So rather than the agent having to read 100, 120 pages of a script, you condense the idea down to a page. So it's a page summary. Mm -hmm. And then you also add a lot of other elements to that, such as, you know, what's the genre? Who's the writer? What are their credits? Um, what's the basic story? What are the character breakdowns? And then, you know, that's sort of the creative side of it. And then you get into the business side of it, which is, um, does this potentially have marketability? Mm -hmm. What are the demographics? What is the appeal? Mm -hmm. Is it well written? Um, and can we make money? Because like I said, <laughs> again, at the end of the day, it's show business. Um, and is this a project that we want to do? And, and, and a lot of those are um, either no, <laughs> we don't, or yes, we do, or an in-between, like a consider. So it's, it's either pass um, or consider 
or yes, go full guns blazing and take this project, which is very, very rare, which I would say, you know, I probably read about a thousand scripts at least yeah. uh, when I was an innovative. Um, and I think, you know, we may have, I may have recommended uh, a dozen scripts mm -hmm. and I think we ended up representing one writer from those. And uh, I don't know that, we had any of those projects actually make it to screen, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So that that's kind of how those percentages break down. It's sad. I don't want it to be that way. Trust me. Yeah. I want everything that I, when I was there, everything I wanted to read, I went in with eternal optimism. I wanted them to be great scripts. I wanted it to be the diamond in the rough. I wanted it to get produced and made, but unfortunately <laughs> it just wasn't the case. Well, and I think in our line of work, you know, we are posting blo blogs and we're on you know LinkedIn and Medium and we're trying to be heard out there. And so often we're not. And so it's kind of like that same parallel that here I've poured my heart and soul into the script and it goes into no man's land and anybody could be reviewing that and tossing it aside. And mm -hmm. you just don't know from a writer's standpoint. Our son, again, Parker, when he was at Chapman, as a, uh, I think it was his junior year, he worked with Sarah Risher, a producer from uh, Nightmare on Elm Street yeah, and course. the new Nightmare. She had that whole franchise. Anyways, he was a coverage re uh, reader for her. And he called me up one day and he goes, man, this is crap and this is crap. I saw a good one the other day and I finally said, son, you're like 20 years old. Who are you to throw out this guy's life or gal's life work? And he goes, hey man, I'm the demo. I don't know, I'm just reading. If it's any good, then it gets bumped up. If I don't think it's any good, the way it goes. And that just really surprised me yeah. that you just don't know where your heart and soul is going and who's looking at it. Well, it's very interesting to see who the gatekeepers are. Mm -hmm. and, and the reality of it is when you break down um, the agency world, uh, the development world, production studios, production companies, a lot of times that reader is going to be the 20 something uh, intern yeah. or newly hired out of college uh, employee. So um, look, when I was an innovative <laughs> artist, I was fresh out of college as well. And, mm -hmm. and uh, the irony is I believe that I had the answers. I think a lot of times <laughs> these readers do. They believe that they deserve to be the gatekeepers and, and, and hold those keys. So um, you know, at the end of the day, I still feel that if it's on the page, it doesn't matter who reads it. They're mm -hmm. going to respond to it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so as long as you can tell a good story, you'll get through that gate uh, and, and hopefully be, you know, inspiring those gatekeepers. Before we take a break, tell us, is there anything from all of that reading that you went through? Is there one, two or three elements that really stand out in a great story that you just know it when you see it in a script? Well, uh, Yes, I think there are a lot of elements. I think it'd be hard to break it down mm -hmm. into three, but I would say the the eye-opening thing for me in moving to Los Angeles in the first place, wanting to be a screenwriter, was I was convinced that it was going to be 100% creative. Mm -hmm. I just thought, you know, as an idealist, I thought, you know, as long as you tell a fascinating, creative story, you can get it done. But unfortunately... Again, going back to it, it's so much more about, I don't think you should ever sacrifice the integrity of your story, mm -hmm. but you need to keep in mind that at the end of the day, it is a business and think about those marketing elements. So I would say one very important thing is just to recognize that you need to tell a story potentially that's going to reach a mass audience. It can't be a niche audience any longer. I mean, you can if you want to do indie films, but if you want to be successful and get a lot of people on board, you really have to think about what your demographic is and keep those in mind when you're telling the story. Again, mm -hmm. don't sacrifice the integrity of the story. You can tell whatever you want, but just keep in mind who you're trying to tell it for. So I think that's probably one of the, the more eye-opening things that I recognize there. Otherwise, um, I think that theme um, and bigger picture is, is very important. You know, I, I've, I've read a lot of scripts that, just to use an example, have come from comedians. And the scenes are hilarious. And I'm <laughs> laughing so yeah. hard. I'm laughing so much, I'm, I'm crying almost. But the overall story, I just don't care about it. Um, what's more important is, can we relate on a humanistic level? Don't just tell me jokes, don't just make me laugh, don't just make me cry, but make me feel something on a humanistic level. Um, I would say that's important. And then the last thing I would just say is really um, you know, a breakdown of characters. Mm -hmm. What do we want when we go to the movies? What do we want when we watch TV or you know, dial into our devices to watch a different thing? We want to see ourselves on the screen. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to relate to someone. So give us a character that we can relate to 
that we can sympathize with, that we can root for, that we want to see their arc until the very end. And if you can do that or all three things of those, you'll be successful and we'll follow you from the beginning to the end. And hopefully we'll see your product on, you know, some medium screen, yeah. phone, computer, you know, whatever that is. Well, and where I've seen this work really, really well with brand work and content marketing are, are people actually just the opposite instead of appealing to everybody, finding that niche, but then tell a story that has character arc in it. And that is specific to that audience so that they understand and can connect with, live vicariously through that character. Even if it's a business-to-business post, it's the same sort of concept. Instead of just blathering on and on about features and benefits of the business offering, introduce a character into it that that reader or that viewer, if it's a YouTube video or whatever, can connect with, much like you guys all know over in Hollywood, and then take them, show them the process that you're trying to quote unquote sell them. So mm-hmm. telling to sell. Um, and it is just really, really powerful. And I think the one thing about us in the marketing business and copywriters and whatever, not necessarily trained. They're usually trained kind of like you were talking about that scene, that quick, funny, comic shtick Great visual, great headline, you know, and then pay it off. And that works really well in print medium. But when we get in online content, we kind of need to caress and and pull that audience along a little bit more. And I think Hollywood and and what you all know over there is just ripe with answers on how to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. I think, um, you know, the thing is with, as I'd mentioned before, the jokes, you know, that can be funny, we still want something that we can walk away with and remember, not just, you know, the, the best thing you can do as a storyteller is whether it's the end of a movie, a TV show, commercial, is have people talk about it. Absolutely. And and continue that conversation. So I think, uh, you know, if you can do that, you've found success. Well, Justin, we're going to take a break. But when we come back, I want to talk about your new movie that uh, you, you've survived it. You got a script that got through everybody. They've made the movie. Richard Dreyfus, Danny Glover, one of my favorite, Napoleon Dynamite. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. John Heater. John Heater's in there, and uh, and Masterson. Is that right? Danny Masterson. Danny Masterson. Yes. yes. So Another when when we talented. come back right after uh, this word from our sponsors, let's talk a little bit about the movie and where it is uh, and when we can expect to see it out. And then also after that, we're going to talk about the work you will be doing in teaching writers, young writers, and what you're seeing changing in Hollywood that us marketers need to be paying attention to So because a lot of that stuff is happening simultaneously in our world as well. Great. So Looking we'll be right back. It. Are you keeping track of sales leads in a spreadsheet or worse, post-it notes all over your desk? Well, there's a better way and it doesn't involve spending a fortune on complex CRM software. For over 25 years, ACT has been the number one best-selling contact and customer management software. It's super affordable and easy to use. ACT helps individuals, small businesses, and sales teams organize prospect and customer details in just one place. It also helps you market products and services more effectively, and most importantly, it drives sales. Try ACT for 30 days by visiting actstory.com and sign up for a chance to win a pair of Bose QuietComfort 20i acoustic noise-canceling headphones, a $299 value. Again, that's actstory.com. Welcome back to Business of Story and our guest today, Hollywood screenwriter Justin Winters. Justin, um, during that break, you and I had a chance to talk a little bit more about the niche market. Um, can you expound on that for our listeners because they weren't with us? Yes, of course. Um, no, I think we were talking before about reaching the masses in some capacity with the storytelling, um, but also reaching you know niche markets. But what's interesting when you look at the industry as a whole, especially in representing writers and representing storytellers, is the storytellers become the niche. So an agent or a manager that's representing a writer is going to represent a writer that's good usually at one thing. Mm-hmm. You can't necessarily be the jack of all trades. So they will have a drama writer. They will have a comedy writer. They'll have a science fiction writer, horror. Every genre of the major seven genres, they will have a writer in that category. So they are the ones who are specializing in that genre and that type of storytelling. Mm-hmm. So that is kind of the niche genre storytelling that you get into. And within those, um, you know, agents will have upwards of 20 to 40 clients that they'll represent. Writers, um, when you say clients? Writers, yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. Um, which can be challenging because if every writer has five or 10 projects, then, you know, 40 times five, uh, 40 times 10. Um, 
but um, but they will try to pigeonhole those clients or those writers that they have mm-hmm. into specific categories of what it is that they write. So um, a story that I've actually shared with you before, Park, uh, which is a fascinating story, uh, is about Stuart Beatty, who I'd mentioned before. Um, Stuart is a, a very talented writer. He uh, was a student at UCLA Extension Writers Program, which is a great writing program out of Los Angeles. Um, and had written a, um, a feature called Joey, which had, had won him a few awards, and, and we picked him up at Innovative Artists. Uh, and we're trying to figure out what kind of storyteller he was. Mm-hmm. And he was very into um, uh, action style, drama style films, and he'd written a project about a pirate. Uh, and it was very, very uh, well written, it was on the page. And so we started shopping him around literally as the pirate guy. I mean, we would call... (laughs) That was his niche. That that was his niche. We would call production companies. We would call networks. We would call producers. And we would say, are you looking for a pirate movie? We got the pirate guy. (laughs) Parrot, iPad, peg leg. You you have to remember, this was before Pirates of the Caribbean, which is what that film eventually became. And so we would pitch him as that niche, that pirate niche. And everyone's like, pirate? What what do I want to tell a pirate story for? You know, now it's like... People obviously have tuned into the little movie Pirates of the Caribbean, and and so that's where we started to get his projects off the ground. So a lot of times, yes, you do try and find that niche mm-hmm. um, in, in storytelling, and and a, as a writer, um, and that genre that you're very good at. For me personally, that's that's drama, yeah. um, dramedy, if you will. Uh, maybe that's a segue into talking about my film that's coming out actually and real quick before yeah. we do that um blake snyder to me in that niche now he's since passed away but apparently he sold more family movies screenplays to disney than anybody did than any screenwriter in um, the 80s and he's got of course that great book save the cat mm-hmm. and it was one of the first books i read about story storytelling and story structure and he you know was self-proclaimed i own this niche in the family mm-hmm. world and i have just just gotten so much from that book. I highly recommend it to any of our listeners if you want to have an insight into how, you know, at least his approach to writing. And I loved his line, too, that screenplays, the ideal screenplay is 110 pages long, um, the same ideal weight of a jockey, 110 yeah. pounds, apparently. Um, so really, really great stuff. But a good book if uh, you're a content marketer out there looking to understand story structure in a very fun way. He also has the follow-up book, Save the Cat Goes to the Movies. And he mm-hmm. has like 40 different movies in there. And you can follow his 15 step beat sheet with mm-hmm. every movie and a lot of people think it actually ruins the movie experience but to me it makes it richer right. because you can really see what's going on and when a movie doesn't connect with you you can kind of go back and not that it plays for every movie but you can see where maybe they missed something within the beat or they didn't have the character development or something needed to happen a little bit more extensively than it did anyways thought it was fascinating yeah and I agree I, I am a big fan of Blake Schneider's and, and he actually had another follow up book which is Save the Cat Strikes Back Ah. Um, which I recommend as well. But, you know, I think what Blake did, there are two camps, some people that really like his work and some people that don't like it as much. Um, but I would say from a structural and formatting standpoint, Save the Cat is is a brilliant piece of work that you should pick up, as you said. I mean, especially if you're a young, budding screenwriter, um, because, and this is something that I talk to my students about, is at the end of the day, you can tell whatever story you want to tell. No, yeah. one's, no one's making any rules about the story that you can tell. Yeah. Um, but there is something called foundation, or, uh, called format and called structure. And that's something that you can learn and save the cat. So the one thing that I tell my students uh, in, in talking about format and structure and something that you really get out of uh, Save the Cat uh, by Blake Schneider is, uh, and let me make this, uh, this metaphor here, or a few of them is, you know, as, as a chef, um, you know, you're always using the same ingredients, but yeah. you can come up with something that tastes different and tastes amazing. So those ingredients are the foundation of the structure. Or as a swimmer, you have to swim between the lines. You know, the, the, the lanes that are there, that's your guidance, that's your structure, that's your format. It's, and, and the last one I'll give you is, you know, you, you wouldn't paint uh, you know, a house or your bedroom before you built the house. So you mm-hmm. really need to understand structure and formatting and, and, and Blake was able to break that down um, in a very you know buddy buddy type wa- yeah. way that was very easy 
um, to understand and to apply in screenwriting. And I think once you've mastered that from Blake, then go on to uh, Robert McKee, which obviously was a guest on this show as well, um, because you know he is um, incredibly, incredibly intelligent, and and all of his books on screenwriting I highly recommend. So add those to your list. Um, they will help you leaps and bounds mm-hmm. as a writer, or as a storyteller, or uh, in a lot of different areas. You know, I got to tell you, back in 2011, we were producing a big event for a multinational company, and it was out in Washington, D.C., and they had uh, their sales team coming in from 140 different countries, and we had been producing this event for many years. They come in Wednesday night. They're all dog tired Thursday but of course Thursday was the event when we rolled out all the new product rolled out the new marketing plans and systems and we would lose half the crowd uh, because they were exhausted and they would head back to their room you know before we were halfway through the show and um, we were brainstorming with the client how we were going to launch this new stuff and keep people in the audience and I had just literally finished at the second reading second time through on Save the Cat and I busted out those 15 beats and I took the client right through it and we designed, believe it or not, a four-hour program based around the 15 beats of, of Save the Cat, and it worked marvelously. We lost very few people, and we even had folks come up after the, the presentation and say, wow, that was like the, one of the best ones I've ever seen. I'm not really sure why, but that was amazing. But it helped us give us that structure to do it. And so I thought, wow, you know, a family genre beat sheet actually played to a multinational crowd in 10 different languages being translated from the stage. And to me, that was a time when it really underscored how universal story story structure and story format is but next story your movie I mean it's so cool to have a movie out tell us about killing Winston Jones and why did you have to kill him (laughs) yes uh, killing Winston Jones um, as you mentioned it's uh, you know it's um, starring Richard Dreyfuss and Danny Glover and John Heater who yes is known from Napoleon Dynamite but is extremely versatile and has done a lot of characters since Uh, Danny Masterson um, Leslie Ann Brandt, who is an up-and-coming star, um, Tyler Labine, uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. Ali Machalka, I'd get in trouble if I didn't mention them only because <laughs> we're all friends now. And they'd be like, how come you left me out of that podcast? Um, Jolie right Fisher, got her too. Um, but no, it's, it's a great ensemble piece. Uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful experience for me. I was very lucky. Uh, it's directed by Joel David Moore. A lot of people know him uh, from the acting world. He was in a film several years back called Dodgeball, and he was in Grandma's Boy, and he was in Avatar. Uh Um, He's a wonderfully talented actor, uh, director. And, um, you know, having worked with Jim Cameron on Avatar, um, I think that kind of fed into his desires to, to really focus on directing. And I think he learned a lot from that. And um, he directed a, a, a film called uh, Spiral, which was a psychological thriller. And then we connected and, and he read Killing Winston Jones and really liked it. So we decided that we would develop it further together and it would be kind of his bigger directorial debut. Um, so it, as I mentioned, it was, it was a great experience for me because I developed a relationship with Joel, mm-hmm. um, who once he read it, attached himself to act in it, direct it, produce it and all that. And, and he dragged me along for the ride. So I was there for pre-production, production, post-production, and now um, am watching the development and, or not development, I'm sorry, the distribution and uh, marketing side of, of filmmaking. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we were, we're very excited with the the finished product um we've it's tested incredibly well audiences are responding they're laughing where we would hope they would laugh and they're <laughs> what's crying. the story about so it uh it's called killing winston jones as you mentioned and uh this is about an an old retired junior high gym teacher uh-huh. who finds out that they're building a new gymnasium at the school that he taught at Uh, his entire life and he desperately desperately (laughs) wants them to name this gym after him you know he wants to leave this legacy uh the only problem is the principal who is an ex-student of his was a little overweight in junior high and never liked the (laughs) pe program and hated winston jones and decides not only am i not going to name it after you but i'm going to name it in memoriam so if you want it that bad you have to pass away, and I'll think about putting your name on the gym. So uh, that's that was just out of personal experience, or how in the world did you come up with this? Uh, this um, well, you know, I, 
It's it's interesting. I I was working at Innovative Artists and I was reading the trades one day. The trades mm-hmm. are the Hollywood Reporter or Variety or Deadline. Um, I highly recommend it for anyone who's in the industry. Always read the trades so you're caught up on the business side of who's selling what and what's being made. But I was reading the trades and I got to the back of Variety and there was a whole spread on an actress who had recently passed away. And she was... Um, a star from the 50s primarily and she'd won a bunch of awards for different performances and I had never heard of her Mm -hmm. and and as I mentioned before I I went to school at UC Santa Barbara I had a great foundation of film history of film I I thought I'd watched almost every movie I should have covered the 50s but for some reason I didn't know who she was and I thought to myself how, what do you have to do these days to leave a legacy? You know, you're someone who is probably you a household name, yeah. you know, in the 40s, 50s, 60s. She's passed away. And now in the 2000s, I don't know who this is. Her legacy didn't last. You know what uh-huh. I mean? For some people it did. But so it started getting me th- to think about what you have to do these days to leave a legacy. And, and I thought, well, what about on a smaller level? And, uh, you know, junior high had always been interesting to me because I feel like, um, you know, this is a development phase in your life. Everything is so important oh, in yeah. life or death. And it's, oh, you know, like you finally start dating the one person you want to date and they break up with you and your life is over, you know, or you get that one kiss and it changes your life and all those things. So the effervescence of who you are at that age, I think, is has always been interesting to me. So I, I thought, well, maybe I design this story around something that happens in junior high. And then I thought, well, what is something you could try to leave a legacy, you know, as, uh, you know, do you want to get a street named after you? Do you want to get, you know, what, what is it that you want to achieve? And I thought, well, what about, you know, trying to get a name on a building or something or just get just wanting to be remembered as a teacher who was important yeah. at a junior high in the middle of nowhere where, um, you know, that'll make you happy before before you pass. Um, so that's kind of where that that story. Uh, I can from. totally relate to that. Growing up in Seattle, went to Canyon Park high school or junior high and they had these two PE teachers Kerwin and Diaz and my brothers that preceded me there always talked about getting hacked by these guys you know this is back in the day where they had the big paddles and they had the holes drilled into them (laughs) and you literally had to reach over and grab your ankles and then they just whack the shit out of you basically (laughs) and um, I was actually coming out of parochial school so only spent one year in in junior high I grew up through St. Brendan's and then was thrust into the public school life and I remember fearing every day that one day I was going to mess up in the ninth grade in junior high and I was going to get hacked. And I remember, like it was yesterday, the very last day, and they were handing out hacks to people because the last day and people were screwing around. And um, I was just sure I was going to get it, and I got by, didn't have to. And I remember wiping my brow, essentially, walking out of there thinking, oh, my God, I survived the entire ninth grade without Kerwin or Diaz hacking me. You know, and that's something that we try to tap into. I think, you know, everyone has memories of what oh, yeah. happened in junior high. If it's if it's ju- if it's um, PE class or if it's math class or science class. So, um, you know, we didn't put this story in a specific time period. So it yeah. could be a little bit more universal. I think some of the houses in the in the movie you would think were from the 50s. Yeah. You know, and, and we don't have a lot of technology, but some things look like they're from the 80s and 90s. So hopefully a lot of people relate to it. Um, But Dreyfus plays uh, Winston Jones, so he's the title character. Um, Danny Masterson actually plays the lead, who is his son, who's the glue of the story, who Uh tries to, you know, he tries to keep this dysfunctional family together and get the name of the gym named after his dad. (laughs) But let me give you one more little thing to hopefully spark your interest. So you're like, yeah, I might go see that in theaters. Um, The Danny Glover character was the girl's PE teacher. And so when he finds out that if you die, you get your name on the gym, he starts competing with Winston Jones. So Danny Glover and Richard Dreyfuss start competing to see who can die first to get their name on the gym. So we got that whole uh, grumpy old men thing going for us. That's pretty twisted, actually. That's pretty (laughs) twisted. Like I said, it's tested well. People are laughing and crying at the same moment. So uh, hopefully that continues. Well, when we come back from this break, let's talk a little bit about when we might see it in the theaters. And as we were talking before the broadcast here, um, things have really changed in distribution for film. And so I'll be curious to hear your thoughts on that and how it impacts us as marketers, you know, what we can learn from that. So uh, we'll be right back with Justin Winters, copywriter from Hollywood, has his new movie coming out, Killing Winston Jones with Richard Dreyfuss. And uh, when we come right back, we're going to learn about that. And what do you see for the future of content and storytelling? Great. Great. 
Did you know that on average, each of us sends around 10,000 emails each year? And what does each message include? Well, an email signature, right? Well, Angie's List realized the reach they had with their 270 employees and decided to use their email signatures to promote their flagship customer event called the Festival of Services. Angie's List dialed up Sigster to become mission control for its email signature campaign. In minutes, each employee had a Sigster-powered call to action in their email signature. In six months, the campaign had been viewed more than 2 million times, resulting in 4,500 visits to the registration portal, or 38% of all visits, which meant Sigster drove more engagement than any other track marketing activity. Now, if you want to ignite the most ubiquitous and overlooked promotional channel in your business from one simple platform, visit Sigster.com. That's S-I-G-S-T-R dot com. And see how they will help you message, measure, and manage your email signature marketing. Hey, if it's good enough for Angie, it's good enough for me. Your customers, employees, marketing campaigns, partners, and yes, your detractors, they're each telling a story right now about you. Where? On social media, in traditional print publications, in blog posts, on television, basically everywhere. And it's happening 24-7, in real time. Your mission? Track these stories and the sources that share them, smartly manage them, analyze them rapidly and discern what you should do next, what you should do now. No wonder you're tired. Well, Zigna Labs is a real-time, cross-media story tracking platform that makes your life easier. Their solution enables customers to quickly spot trends, see relevant stories unfold, and take action. So stay ahead of what the world thinks with Zigna Labs. Learn more and sign up for a free demo at zignalabs.com forward slash story. Welcome back to the Business of Story with our guest today, Justin Trevor Winters, that I keep getting it caught up in my mind with killing Winston Jones, trust <laughs> Justin w- Trevor's Winters. So I, I just, for whatever reason, I'm having a hard time processing that. But when's the movie coming out? You've got it done. It's in the can, right? Yes. Um, that's the million dollar question. I think, um, you know, this is a, an independent film and a little indie film. So uh, you want to make sure that you have. Uh, marketing and distribution in mm-hmm. place and, and strongest as possible. So you look at times of the year that would be a good time to release it. So now it's in the hands of those people who make those decisions. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, the initial thought was we were going to be out in June, but then we pushed to November and now we're potentially pushing to next year. So uh, it's all about, yeah, just finding the right time where we can get the most exposure and have the most success. And um, getting back to the business side of it, make the most money for the people so we can go have fun and do the whole process all over again. How frustrating is that for you as the writer creator of this? I don't think frustrating is the word for it. I think maybe challenging. Um, if, if you break down the amount of time it's taken from uh, fade in for me, which is page one of writing uh, for Killing Winston Jones, it'll have been over seven years mm-hmm. to see it get to screen. So wow. it's a long and tedious process um, I optioned the script four times, mm-hmm. three, four times. What do you mean company. by option? Option means you sell it to an entity, a producer, a production company, a studio, and they have the option of making it. Mm-hmm. So a production company will option 30 scripts and they'll make two. Gotcha. And if they yeah. don't make it, they put in a turnaround and after a certain amount of time, you can get it back. Mm-hmm. So I optioned it a few times before it got made. So it was a roller coaster ride. There was ups and downs the entire time. Um, It's been challenging, but I'm so happy. I think the integrity of the story is still there. Um, I'm I'm so excited for everyone to see it. And it's just a matter of time. Yeah. And, you know, I'm keeping myself busy with so many other projects that I think about it all the time. And I think about the day that it'll be on the screen. But still, it's it's a bit of an afterthought because I know it's going to happen sooner rather than later. So So you've been teaching both over at UCLA and will be starting at ASU. Um, What what are you teaching and what do you tell your up and coming writers? Um, yeah, I, I was teaching um, introduction to screenwriting at UCLA at their UCLA Extension Writers Program, which mm-hmm. is the program I mentioned before that Stuart Beatty graduated from. A lot of um, very successful writers have come out of that program. So mm-hmm. I was honored to be teaching over there. Um, also did quite a bit of guest lecturing at UCLA proper, uh, as well as UC Santa Barbara and some of the other universities there, um, and was finally given the opportunity to teach here at Arizona State. 
um, which I'm very excited about. It's their film and media studies program in, con- in conjunction with their English program. Oh, cool. Um, and so they are very heavy into storytelling. Um, and they are, you know, I, I met with the dean and I eventually met with the heads of the English department and uh, the film and media studies program. And they're wanting to start doing some, you know, fun, new, exciting things um, to, to get opportunities for their students, their graduating students, and, and set them on the right path to achieve um, all the, their goals and, and dreams that they want to when they move to Los Angeles. And why wouldn't they? The proximity to Los Angeles, an hour flight or a mm-hmm. five hour, six hour drive. Um, so at Arizona, we've decided that I will be uh, teaching um, writing for television uh, this spring, as well as story analysis uh, mm-hmm. for film and television. Um, and eventually, I think we might develop some other courses, probably some in advanced screenwriting and advanced storytelling across mediums. Because, you know, in talking about the future and getting into the future of storytelling, um, you know, I really want to explore that arena and make sure that we're covering it for the students because everything is just changing at such a rapid rate. Um, you talk about the new uh, large demographic for, for uh, storytellers is the millennial generation, and they're wanting to watch what they want, when they want, where they want, and how they want to do it. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times it's you know, on the bus, on their way to work, (laughs) on their cell phone, you know, with their Mm -hmm. headphones in or something. And that's how they're going to watch the material that they are interested in watching. It's no longer just going to a movie theater or tuning into your favorite show. Um, So a little bit in the story analysis class that I'm teaching, uh, again, it's the foundation of storytelling. So, Mm -hmm. So format and structuring first and foremost, so we know how to tell a compelling story. And then getting into ideas, how to come up with that creative idea that people haven't maybe come up with yet, or finding an idea that's really worked and tweaking it so that it's your own, changing mm-hmm. that recipe so that the the dinner is a little different in your own, um, and then getting into the the medium of that storytelling, mm-hmm. so the the platform of that storytelling, film, television, uh, cell phone, digital, web series, whatever that looks like. Does story change um, from a creative standpoint, whether it's going to be on a big screen or on the screen in the palm of your hand? Do you have to approach it differently or is basic story structure basic story structure? Um, I think there are probably different camps um, on that uh, in answering that question. For me, I think storytelling is storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there more often than not is going to be a beginning middle and end whether it's 10 seconds long or i guess let's use vine as an example if if you know you know youtube videos if you know vine videos these are videos that are i think seven seconds long or whatever it is it's under 10 seconds and you have to tell some sort of story and like you know a lot of them will be practical jokes or this and that but you know there are reasons why some of those um go viral and a lot of times it's because they're telling a very interesting compelling story in seven seconds so you have to learn how to tell it if it's seven seconds or if it's 90 minutes or two hours or what that looks like Mm -hmm. so i think storytelling really is storytelling um at the end uh and what would you tell our listeners that you've learned through all those scripts and writing and you know from your hollywood perspective of how can we as business leaders and communicators be better at what we do are there any a couple three tips that you can share with us yeah i would say one thing is um writing is rewriting so never be afraid of changing what you have mm-hmm. as bulletproof as you think it is or as good as you think it is be able to collaborate and mm-hmm. listen to other people because um Constructive criticism, uh, although it'll seem like your worst enemy, is is the best asset you have. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing is, you know, you're gonna have that canvas, and you're gonna paint a painting, and then 20 people are gonna show up with paintbrushes, and they're <laughs> gonna want to paint all over it, and you're gonna tear your hair out, and it's and it's you know gonna kill you. But that is part of the process. So I would say always be open to evolving, changing, revising until you get it to a place where you're getting the response that you want. Mm-hmm. So never settle. Always look for um, achieving the, you know, especially in advertising, or achieving the biggest response possible. Because mm-hmm. you can, you know, getting back to what we were talking about with niches, if you look at a small film like Little Miss Sunshine, you know, this is a film that's made for a couple million dollars. They're expecting to hit the indie market, maybe make a couple million dollars in sales. This was, uh, you know, a global phenomenon. I mean, everyone watched it. Everyone loved it. It made millions and millions of dollars because the story was well 
written. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was good storytelling at the end of the day. So, um, you know, as niche as you want to be and figuring out exactly who your demo is, you still focus on them, but recognize if you do it well, everyone's going to relate to it. Mm-hmm. What makes for a good story? Ooh, <laughs> That's a, that is In a the very most good simplest question. of terms. You're just trying to trip me up. Um, I think it's relatability. You know, again, we we tune into a radio broadcast or a podcast. We watch our favorite TV show. We watch our favorite movie, our favorite web series, because we see ourselves in one or more of those characters. Mm-hmm. We project ourselves on the screen, and therefore we go along with the ride. Mm-hmm. So and the biggest thing is, is just allowing your viewer or your reader or whoever's taking in your content to relate to it mm-hmm. and, and to buy into it and root for whoever it is that you know, they, they relate to. Yeah, and really the main character of that story is a proxy for us, is it not? That we are sitting there watching Luke Skywalker do his thing, and we are living vicariously through Luke, so when he goes to fight, you know, Darth Vader, he's trying on, he's going through trouble. We get to try it on in the safety and comfort mm-hmm. of our own seat. But we have that relatability, I guess, is what you... Yeah, I agree. I mean, you can break down so many different types of story. I mean, as of late, there's been a big push with the anti-hero. Mm-hmm. You look at shows like Breaking Bad and the Walter White character, where we're literally following the story and most often rooting for a guy who's selling methamphetamines <laughs> and taking other people's lives, yeah. you know. Um, But it's because we can understand at the core what is the theme or the bigger picture of that show. It's about a guy who's been diagnosed um, with a terminal illness Mm -hmm. who desperately wants to leave money behind so that his family can survive. Mm -hmm. You know, he has a a handicapped child that he wants to be able to um, have, you know, uh, finances left behind so that they can afford yeah. to take care of him. So at the heart of it, we understand his plight, where he goes from He's, there, his trajectory <laughs> and his arc is just, uh, you know, ridiculous. Um, but we still tune in week to week because we want to see, you know, if he's going to achieve it or not. Yeah. Because we relate in some level. Have you seen Nightcrawler with uh, Jake I Gyllenhaal? Yes. I mean, I watched it the second time. Parker again was in town. So he and I watched it and we dissected it when he was here. That is, to me, one of the more brilliant uh, indie movies I've seen in a while. But talking about a dark character, an anti-hero that you're not pulling for, then you are pulling for, and then you're not pulling for, um, and he just completely sucks you into the story. And to me, anyways, I thought it was really brilliant storytelling and writing. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think that's an example of um, another area of storytelling which is extremely important is the world that you create. Mm-hmm. You know, that is the world of night crawling. It's these <laughs> guys who go out and, and literally look for accidents to yeah. happen so that they can cover it and give it to the nudes. I mean, that's a fascinating story. <laughs> I, I've created worlds around the black market organ trade, yeah. you know, which is a very dark and disturbing area, but it's it's a world. You, you can visualize that world when you hear it. I've written stories about human trafficking and sex trafficking. Again, it's a very dark world, but you understand that world. So I think if you can create a very interesting world that's compelling, that can pull people in, mm-hmm. um, that's also going to help you in your... Well, and in Nightcrawler, I think it helps to be at the top of your game there if you're a psychopath as well. And, and <laughs> yes. Gyllenhaal does a pretty good job with that yeah. character. That's their definition of, you know, a pure psychopath. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure they hit all 18 traits of psychopath, whatever that is. Yeah, it's, it's really, really well done. Well, Justin, you've got a lot on your plate and you're teaching. You've got your film coming out. You also do a lot online uh, for educating folks through some videos that you've done. Can you tell us a little bit, little bit about that? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, I contribute to a few different entities, one of which is filmcourage.com, which I highly recommend uh, checking out. Um, Primarily what they do are interviews. Um, I've done quite an extensive interview with them as well on screenwriting, directing, acting, kind of the entire business of the entertainment industry. Mm-hmm. Um, they do it very, very well. They're starting to now interview A-list actors, and they're really starting to take off. But their foundation is just being able to um, offer insight into the industry and also inspire um, young artists to and artists of all ages, actually, to achieve their goals and their aspirations in the industry. And that was filmcourage.com? Filmcourage.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's David Brannon and, and Karen Warden who run uh, the site. Um, and, yeah, again, it's just I, I can't plug it enough. It's a great site. Um, also working with John Rhodes over at screencraft.org, um, which... 
um, has a bunch of different layers. Actually, they they offer screenwriting competitions. They mm-hmm. also offer screenwriting fellowships. Um, they also do big panels with producers, writers, directors, studio executives um, in the industry uh, that you can check out in Los Angeles. Um, and and I've contributed a few different articles to them as well. Uh, and so I recommend checking them out. And then ISA also, uh, which is the International Screenwriters Association. So those are all great places. And do you have to be a screenwriter to really appreciate these resources? I mean, isn't it really good for anybody in the storytelling business? Again, yes. It's, it's uh, a huge asset to anyone who wants to tell a story in any capacity. I think we use kind of uh, screenwriting as an umbrella term. Mm-hmm. Really, at the end of the day, it's just storytelling. Because really we're is. not just screenwriters. We're storytellers. We're writing for the screen, but we're writing for... TVs, we're writing for computers, we're yeah. writing for digital, all that stuff, advertising. So it's it's all there for you. It's it's a great resource. Um, I would I would check those out. Great. And then the final question: Can we see Killing Winston Jones a trailer somewhere? How can the viewers go and take a look at uh, what you've got going? Yes, uh, the trailer should be up uh, very soon. Actually, hopefully while you're listening to this, the trailer will be up. I would just say easiest way is probably Google search Killing Winston Jones. You'll get a bunch more information. Or um, for you uh, film buffs and nerds out there, IMDB, which is (laughs) internetmoviedatabase.com. IMDB.com has all the information, Mm -hmm. tells about the the actors and, and the story and the writers and and directors and all that. So um, I love the movie poster, by the way, with Richard Dreyfuss holding the TV set in standing knee deep in water in his bathtub, just yes. waiting to do the deed. Yes. If there's, if there's any reason to Google search it, it is that the uh, the eventual billboard and movie poster. Yes, is Richard Dreyfuss in a bathtub about to kill himself naked. <laughs> holding a TV set. So if that doesn't get you there, I don't know what's going to get you there. <laughs> well, thank you for taking the time to be with us. I know our, our listeners will really love this particular program. And thank you all for tuning in to Business of Story. Be with us next week. You know, we were going every other week, but now we're up once a week because you all have asked for it. So I, it's fantastic. I appreciate it. If you are listening to us through iTunes, please go on and give us a rating and give us your insights and certainly share it with your world. And if you'd like some free storytelling tools, go to businessofstory.com. In fact, I've got a brand new one up there that just went up last week, which takes you through our 10-step story cycle process. It's a free download. And with it, I've included uh, videos and other resources so that you can see each chapter of the story cycle process and how you can use it for your own personal story, um, but uh, more importantly, tying that into your brand story. So go to businessofstory.com, go to the tool. It's at the top of the tools section. It says new there, and it's your new online storytelling tool. Um, Hopefully, you'll find it uh, very helpful and would love to hear your thoughts on it. So um, while you're at the site, you can shoot me a note as well. And also want to remind you, if you are interested in what you're hearing and would like to know more about our process of Business of Story, we are available. I'm available for speaking engagements, workshops, one-on-one with clients, or we bring in groups of folks and do storytelling workshops and do them here at our office in Phoenix, Arizona or certainly travel around the country to do that as well. And if you are trying to get your brand story dialed in and really understand what it's all about, uh, that's really what the story cycle process is all designed for, and I would love to help you in that process. So you can reach me through businessofstory.com or shoot me an email at park at parkandco.com. That's park at P-A-R-K-A-N-D-C-O.com. Thanks again for listening, and we will be back with you with another great guest next week. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to The Business of Story. Don't forget there are terrific free storytelling resources for you at thebusinessofstory.com, where you'll also find the complete show archive. The Business of Story is sponsored by Oracle Marketing Cloud, Park & Co., Sixter, Zignal Labs, and ACT, and is produced by Convince & Convert Media. Find more great shows like The Business of Story at marketingpodcasts.com, the first search engine for marketing podcasts.